The Peacekeepers are the policing force in the city of Kanai Ward, as featured in Master Detective Archive's Rain Code. They began as a simple security department for Amaterasu Corporation, but as the company itself grew in power, so too did the Peacekeepers. The protagonist Yuma encounters multiple important Peacekeepers throughout the game, as well as many unnamed and insignificant grunts. It's undeniable that the Peacekeepers are a frightening foe. They often mistreat the residents of the city and mishandle criminal cases. They reach rushed conclusions about crimes and actively cover up the truth for their own benefit. The root of all these problems is the director, Yomi Hell Smile. I already made a separate video on him, so I won't mention him here except when he's relevant to the other characters. All of the other named peacekeepers except for one appear in only a single chapter. If I were to make individual videos on each of them, they would all be really short, so I've decided to just lump them together into one video. Now, moving along, let's take a look at the peacekeepers. Swank Katsunel appears in chapter after Zero. After Yuma gets off the Amaterasu Express, Swank corners him and accuses him of killing the other detectives on the train. He tries to arrest Yuma, but he's thwarted when Yako shows up. Yako convinces him to back down by threatening to get the WDO involved. And after that, Swank is never seen again. Or heard about. Literally no one utters his name a single time in the entire rest of the game. He shows up, causes problems, and then he's gone. Swank is pretty much all about money and food. His in-game profile lists his like as Fatty Sirloin State and his talent as speed eating. It also says he likes money almost as much as he likes eating. This is probably an indication of some kind of greed, and money in particular could be an incentive or a motivation for him to continue acting in corrupt and immoral ways within the Peacekeepers. Swank's name is obviously a bit of a strange one. His first name refers to some kind of showy display, especially in the way someone dresses or acts. This would definitely make sense with the massive golden coat he wears. As a side note, in the original Japanese, Swank's name is actually Spank, as in to smack someone on the butt as a form of punishment. It's pretty easy to see why they changed it in English. The jokes about that one could have been pretty ruthless. And as for his last name, Katsuno, I have no idea. I tried looking it up and I got nothing. I don't have a clue what this man's last name means. It does have sort of a haughty, arrogant vibe to it, I guess, but that could just be me that thinks that. As for Swank's design, it's pretty much all about money. His eyes kind of look like gold coins. The word money is literally written on his teeth. His cigar smoke makes the yen symbol, and his sideburns look like barcodes. There's also the massive golden coat I mentioned before, and it definitely looks pretty expensive. Overall, Swank is a pretty useless and forgettable character. Sure, he does what he's gotta in Chapter Zero, but otherwise he's just not there. When I started to take notes for this video, I even initially wrote down Seth as the first one to take a look at. I straight up just forgot Swank existed for a few minutes. Yeah, that's that's about all I've got to say for this guy. He loves money and eating, and he doesn't appear outside of Chapter Zero. Let's move on now. Seth Burrow appears in Chapter 1. He's the chief of the investigation team section of the Amaterasu Peacekeepers. He's handling the Nailman cases and wants the detectives to remain uninvolved. One of his most notable features is his use of a megaphone to be heard because he otherwise speaks too quietly. Seth threatens Yako's life to try and get him to withdraw the detectives and tell them to stand down, which puts a pretty solid time pressure on Yuma and Halora's investigation. He appears as a mystery phantom in the Mystery Labyrinth. Notably, he's the only Peacekeeper that appears in a labyrinth to appear alongside the culprit's phantom. This is probably because he was actively working with the priest to cover up the truth of the nail man murders. At the end of the chapter, Yomi and Martina show up. They accuse Seth of covering up the nail man murders in order to keep receiving bribes from the church. He tries to say he only did so under Yomi's orders, but this is quickly brushed aside. As punishment, Yomi orders his execution, so as far as we know, this man is now dead. Seth's first name is of Hebrew origin, and it means appointed or placed. It originally from a biblical figure that was the third son of Adam and Eve. I'm not too sure how this ties into his character, except that he was probably appointed to his position. Burroughs, his surname, means in the borough or borough. A borough is a town or a district that is also an administrative unit, and a borough is a small tunnel dug by a little animal as a dwelling. Both of these could reference his sort of high position within the peacekeepers, as well as his weak and feeble nature. Seth's design is pretty simple and unimpressive. He wears a large blue coat, and the writing near the bottom of it reads Amaterasu because that's where he works. He wears a monocle over his right eye, and his hair covers his left eye. And that's about it. There's not really anything else I can think to point out about his design. Seth is never mentioned outside of Chapter 1, but at least he's more relevant than Swank, which is a 
very low bar to set. Guillaume Hall and Dominic Foltank both appear in Chapter 3. They're the leader and vice leader of the Peacekeepers Counterterrorism Squad. They try to hunt down Yuma after he plants bombs for the resistance that he believed were cameras. Guillaume and Dominic have very few appearances and only one direct confrontation with Yuma and the others. They mostly feel kind of distant and detached from the story. They appear in the Mystery Labyrinth as phantoms, but there's nothing particularly noteworthy or special about their appearance there. I guess I can sum them up by saying they're just kind of there. They don't really do much, and then they're gone after Chapter 3 to just never be mentioned again. I can't really tell if these two are more forgettable than Swank, but I think they have the edge over him because they at least have more screen time, I think. I'm not really sure. Weom's first name is a French name meaning Resolute Protector, which makes sense. She leads the counter-terrorism squad, so she can be viewed as protecting Kanai Ward in a way. Her surname, Hall, means a spacious residence. Maybe she lives in a mansion or something, I don't know, I wouldn't be surprised. Dominic's first name means belonging to God or of the Master, which could be tied to his subservience to Guillaume and how he takes orders from her. Full Tank is obviously not a real name and probably literally means a full tank of gas or something. That could be related to his physical strength and power. Now, on to their designs. Guillaume's eyes look like crosshairs and her teeth resemble those of a shark. These tie to the idea of her being a predator. Her in-game profile even says she dislikes boring prey, which furthers the comparison between her and some kind of hunter. The writing on her jacket translates to toxicity, and yeah, she seems pretty damn toxic. The most significant aspects of Dominic's design are the heavy prosthetic or cybernetic enhancements and modifications he has. He's also a very large and strong guy. I'm pretty sure he's the tallest character in the game at over seven feet tall. I can't remember exactly why he has all of these modifications, if there even is a reason given for it. I don't think it's mentioned anywhere in the game or in his profile, and it may have been touched on in a loading screen, but I can't remember. Chapter 3 has a lot of problems, and Guillaume and Dominic are just one of them. I think the chapter could be improved even just slightly if they had more than just one or two appearances. They don't really feel like a threat until the very end because they show up so rarely. Martina Electro is the only named peacekeeper besides Yomi who appears in multiple chapters. She makes her first appearance at the end of chapter 1, where she helps Yomi arrest Seth for his abuse of power. Here, she's also introduced as the vice director of the peacekeepers. Martina's next appearance is in chapter 2 as the one handling the murder of Kaden. She arrests Kurumi because she believes she put poison in the wine bottle. Martina appears in the mystery labyrinth. However, uniquely, she is the only peacekeeper to show up just a single time in the labyrinth. She only appears at the start, accuses Kurumi, and then disappears and doesn't show up again through the rest of the labyrinth. I find this pretty interesting. A phantom represents someone interfering with the case in the real world. So the fact that Martina's phantom just disappears after Yuma proves Kurumi can't be the culprit is pretty significant. It could mean she wasn't particularly invested in covering up the truth of the case. And considering she probably didn't actually know who did it, there wasn't a whole lot of covering up she could do. She had no arguments beyond blaming Kurumi, and so she just had nothing to say after Kurumi was proven innocent. At the end of chapter 2, the detective submarine is blown up. Martina tells Yomi that she's the one who prepared the torpedo. He becomes upset and violent towards her and admonishes her for her perceived failures. This is where Yomi orders Martina to be executed by being pressed into a cube. This terrifies her, understandably, and she begs him for mercy. She's only broken even further when Yomi asks her what love is, which just reveals and confirms that he never loved her or cared about her. She clearly believed he did. She describes herself as showered with love by Yomi, and she held him in very high regard. So for him to turn against her, order her to be killed, and also tell her he never loved her was just too much for her to bear. For all of chapter 3 and most of chapter 4, Martina is presumed dead. But then she reappears at the end of chapter 4. She reveals Makoto stopped the execution order against her and saved her life. She helps him arrest Yomi, after which she plans to resign from her position in the Peacekeepers. She calls this her way of taking accountability as Yomi's accomplice. Finally, Martina is mentioned in the epilogue. An NPC tells Kurumi that Martina was seen helping to clean up the flooding and massive mess in Marunamon district. Overall, Martina is a pretty solid character. She goes from undyingly loyal to Yomi to being horribly betrayed by him and then finally to facing down her abuser and arresting him. The mention of her in the epilogue helping to clean up Marunamon district just further confirms that she really has changed and wants to help to make the city better. Martina's first name by itself means Son of Mars in reference to the Roman god of war. However, it probably instead comes from the Martin bird. Her name in Japanese 
Japanese is swallow, which is also a kind of bird, and a marten is a type of swallow. Because of the bird theming of her name, you could liken her to a caged bird when she's still trapped with Yomi. She was then released from her cage and set free when she turned against him. Her last name, Electro, is related to electricity, which is something very fast and powerful. It can also tie to lightning bolts, which are often a symbol of sudden illumination or realization. This would make sense for Martina because she had to face the fact that Yomi never cared about her in just a small handful of moments. It was this heavy and sudden betrayal that sparked her change for the better. Martina's eyes have circles in them, which can contrast with Yomi's squares. The hat she wears has two stars, which indicates an authority level just below Yomi, whose hat has three stars. The rest of her design is mostly insignificant. Her red thigh-high socks help to break up the monotony of the rest of the bland colors of her design. This is kind of similar to Yomi, whose grays and whites are disrupted by his bright red hair. It was a pleasant surprise to me when Martina showed up again at the end of chapter 4. Like I bet most people did, I had just assumed she was executed like Yomi ordered. It was nice to see her come around and realize that she was in the wrong and accept that she never deserved someone like Yomi anyway. On the whole, the peacekeepers aren't necessarily terrible. The entire group serves the purpose of acting as an oppressive and tyrannical force within Kanai Ward. The threat and pressure they represent can be felt pretty regularly. However, the named peacekeepers suffer from the same problem as many of the detectives do. They're just not present outside of a single chapter. In fact, in that regard, they're even worse than the other detectives because at least the detectives show up outside of their feature chapter. The only exception to this, of course, is Martina. I love her and I'm glad she was redeemed, but I wish all of the others were given just as much importance in the story. Most of the named peacekeepers, I would say, are one of the game's weak points. They're very one-dimensional, and while it's not really a problem that they don't have a whole lot of depth, their limited screen time makes them feel less like characters characters and more like literal roadblocks that just get in the way. I wish the others besides Martina were at least mentioned outside of the chapter they appeared in. It sort of feels like they just completely disappear from the story and the world after their screen time is over. There's my take on it. Most of them are underutilized. Martina's great though. I love her. I hope you enjoyed this little discussion of Raincode's Peacekeepers. Thanks for watching, like and subscribe if you enjoyed, and have a good day!